On the morning of Sunday, October 14, 1962, United States Air Force Major Stephen Hayser left Edwards Air Force Base in California flying a U-2 spy plane designed for the CIA. His mission was to fly five hours southeast at 72,000 feet and turn north and cross over Cuba's restricted airspace for seven minutes during which time specially designed cameras captured photos of alleged nuclear missile sites. After a total flight time of seven hours, he touched down in Florida where the film was delivered under guard of, to the President of the United States in Washington, D.C. The inform taken for these photographs began one of the most heated and delicate diplomatic situations in American history that became known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. The president and Sarah would already expected. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev had made an agreement with Cuba's communist dictator, Fidel Castro, and made at least 90 nuclear missiles in Cuba pointed at the United States. This move by the Soviets shifted the rivalry between the U.S. and Soviet Union in Khrushchev's favor and threatened to escalate the Cold War and put President Kennedy in a tight spot as to what to do about it. The possibility of war, especially the nuclear one, was not something that the president wanted, but he also knew that he had to do something. President Kennedy thought about taking action over diplomacy. The U.S. could launch an airstrike on the missile sites and easily destroy them. But he was afraid if he took extreme actions against the Soviets, they would retaliate by taking over all of Berlin. Instead, he chose to place a naval blockade around the island of Cuba to block the Soviets from sending more missiles to Cuba. Now the showdown has begun. For the first time, the cities of the United States and the people who live in them are vulnerable if war comes. Next, he went to the American people and explained to them the situation. A broadcast so soon after the top secret mission of the U-2 spy plane seemed an unusual step even then, but the broadcast had other intentions in mind. President Kennedy understood that the Soviets would see the broadcast, which offered the president an opportunity for diplomacy, while at the same time, he explained that the military might of the U.S. would be brought to bear in Cuba should the Soviets not seek diplomacy as well. He then sent a letter to Khrushchev that stated that he would not permit the weapons to be delivered to Cuba. In the letter, he explained the position of the United States. At our meeting in Vienna, I expressed our readiness and desire to find, through peaceful diplomacy, a solution to any and all problems that divide us. At the same time, I made clear that in the view of the objectives of the ideology to which you adhere, the United States could not tolerate any action on your part which in a major way disturbed the overall existing balance of the power in the world. I stated that an attempt to force abandonment of our responsibilities and commitments in Berlin would constitute such an action that the United States would resist it with all its power at command. On October 24th, Khrushchev responded to President Kennedy. I must say, frankly, that measures indicated in your statement constitute a serious threat to the peace and security of the nations. The United States is openly taking a, pa taking a path of grossly violating the United Nations Charter, the path of violating international norms of freedom of navigation on the high seas, the path of aggressive actions both against Cuba and against the Soviet Union. And naturally, we cannot recognize the right of the United States to, to establish control over armaments which are necessary for the Republic of Cuba to strengthen its defense capability. While Khrushchev threatened to take action if Soviet naval ships were stopped en route to Cuba, Kennedy pondered options that he su could suggest for possible settlements such as removal of U.S. missiles in Turkey and Italy in exchange for Soviet to remove their missile sites in Cuba. President Kennedy also made sure through diplomatic channels that he found had assistance and support of the U.K., Canada, Brazil, Colombia, and Venezuela, which he had found supported the U.S. 100%. The Soviets themselves debated what action, if any, they would take with the news about the U.S. blockade around Cuba. The Soviet ambassador to Cuba, Alexander Alikseev, was Fidel Castro's connection to Khrushchev. Alikseev believed, as did Castro, that the U.S. would no doubt strike Cuba, thus a preemptive nuclear war and conventional strike against the U.S. should occur first, essentially calling it an all-out war with the U.S. Divisions. Castro pleads with Khrushchev. He says an invasion is coming. Up to now, the Kremlin has turned a deaf ear. Now, Castro's needs coincide with Khrushchev's. On Cuban TV, Castro denounces the blockade. Everything has been a total fiasco for the Americans. Now they attempt to prevent us from defending ourselves. They expect us not to look for help from the socialist camp. That is imperialism. Khrushchev finally found the idea reckless and convinced Castro not to publicly speak about the nuclear strike. Soviet foreign minister to the U.S., a Adri Gromyko argued with the Kremlin against placing missile sites in Edna, Cuba, but 
outwardly told the U.S. officials they were for defense only. Soviet Deputy Minister Anastasmiko recommended to Khrushchev that the Soviets should have a counter blockade and put pressure on the U.S. in Berlin. Khrushchev decided to run Soviet ships up to the blockade line, but he ordered his ships not to cross the line. U.S. officials also debated what the Soviets would do now and how the U.S. should respond. U.S. Attorney General and brother to the President, Robert Kennedy, was the most informed about the President's advisors because he was in direct contact with the Soviet Embassy, who instructed the Attorney General, General that he believed Khrushchev would choose to break the blockade because for Khrushchev, this confrontation was more about showing strength against the U.S. than it was the best interest of Cuba. President Kennedy's military leaders advised the President that the U.S. should board the Soviet ships outside of the blockade to inspect their cargo a move that the Attorney General was against. Kennedy chose not to have the Soviet ships boarded and wanted to remain on the side of, the, of caution when it came to action. Hitchens flared when the Soviet ship Bucharest was lost from radar, but found soon after inside the blockade line. Faced with decisions of taking action, attempting communication, or doing nothing, Kennedy ordered the U.S. ship Gearing approach the ship and exchange greetings to see what type of relay was given. The chief of Gearing radioed Bucharest and asked what her intentions were. A Soviet naval officer replied that it was bound with supplies for Cuba. The U.S. gang was within yelling distance of Bucharest and could see that none of the cargo was military in nature and allowed the ship to continue. This exchange of communication eased tensions greatly and brought a sigh of relief from the U.S. Soon after, Soviet ships turned around and went home. The next day, on October 26th, Khrushchev wired Washington that he wanted to negotiate a mutual deal that would work for both sides. He thought, as did Kennedy, that if the U.S. dismantled the missiles in Turkey, the Soviets would do the same in Cuba. It looked like things were going to work out with a major setback occurred on October 27th when a U U.S. U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba and the pilot killed. This event called into action 50 U.S. jets and threatened to start World War III. Luckily, President Kennedy correctly assumed that the order to shoot down the U-2 plane had not come from the Soviets. Khrushchev informed Kennedy that he had not ordered the firing of a Samus without the U-2 plane, which Kennedy said he believed him to be telling the truth. Both sides learned an important lesson about the involvement of the third party, especially one like Cuba. The next day, October 28th, President Kennedy sat down with Soviet officials in Washington, D.C. and decided to go with the original plan. The deal was that the Soviets would remove the missiles from Cuba and the U.S. would remove their missiles from Turkey and Italy and agree not to invade Cuba. With that, war was avoided through mutual diplomacy or of both the U.S. and the Soviets. Aftermath. Politically, it was the Soviets who suffered the most from the deal made to end the Cuban Missile Crisis. Khrushchev was viewed by the Communist bloc as having backed down almost entirely to the U.S. This was because Khrushchev had not made sure in the agreement that it would make the deal public, all that most of the world saw that the Soviets were moving their missiles from Cuba and leaving the Caribbean, which made Kennedy look like the clear victor. They were unaware of the removal of the U.S. missile sites in Turkey and Italy. The event led to Khrushchev's downfall in the fall of 1963. The Soviet premier was outside from office, but Khrushchev didn't consider this much of a defeat because one, he was older and ready to retire, and two, because he had the, an option to retire. Under Stalin, no such option would have been available. Anyone seen as weak was shot. Now, now everything is different, he said. The fear is gone, and we can talk as equals, and that's my contribution. I won't put up a fight. For President Kennedy, the Cuban Missile Crisis increased his administration's credibility to deal with the communists with a hard line, but still able to avoid a war. He managed to fend off Soviet aggression in the Western Hemisphere and reposition the nation, as one of strength through diplomacy backed with military power. The president's popularity increased as the country entered 1963. His potential as a strong political and diplomatic leader increased in the summer of 1963 and renewed his commitment to Berlin and West Germany and the unification of Western Europe for democracy.